Hello, everybody. It's Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is Monday, the 2nd of August, 2021. Today's topic is the truth about tariffs. During the past 30 years, most historians claim that slavery was the dominant cause of the Civil War. They increasingly insist that the South's opposition to protective tariffs was a minimal factor even though such tariffs were outlawed by the Confederate Constitution. Historian Mark William Palin, for example, writes, one of the most egregious of all so-called lost cause narratives suggests that the war was not about slavery, but instead about the protective tariff. On the 2nd of March, 1861, the moral tariff was signed into law by outgoing President James Buchanan. A pernicious lie quickly formed around the tariff passage, a lie suggesting that somehow this tariff caused the U.S. Civil War. By ignoring slavery's central role in precipitating secession and civil war, the tariff myth, called, uh, the tariff myth has survived in the United States for more than a century and a half, and it needs to be debunked once and for all. Now, that's Professor Palin. But to begin, Palin fails to note that the antebellum tariffs accounted for about 90% of federal tax revenues, even though most of his comrades readily concede that point. Thus, tariff policy was as important to antebellum Americans as federal tax policy today. Beyond that, Palin fails, falls into three traps that often entangle his fellow so-called woke historians. First, he equates the causes of Southern secession with the causes of the Civil War. But they are not the same. The North could have let the initial seven cotton states leave in peace, as many leaders such as Horace Greeley, Edwin Stanton, and future president Rutherford Hayes were willing to do, or at least willing to acquiesce to it. There was no danger that the South would invade the North. War came only after the North decided to invade the initial seven cotton states to coerce them back into the Union. Thus discovering the war's causes requires that we as students of the Civil War analyze the North's reasons for wanting to coerce the South back into the Union. Instead of why the South seceded, we don't need to just focus on why the South seceded. We also need to learn why the North chose to coerce the initial seven cotton states back into the Union. The true goal that prompted Northerners to invade the South, invade those seven states, was to avoid the economic consequences of disunion. Since the Confederate Constitution outlawed protective tariffs, her tariffs would confront the remaining states of the truncated union with two consequences. First and foremost, a low Confederate tariff would cause Southerners to buy more manufactured goods from Europe as opposed to the Northern states where prices were inflated by protective tariffs. The, two, the three biggest uh, protected industries and the three biggest domestic industries uh, were um, cotton textile manufacturing, uh, iron products, and woolen products, all three protected by protective tariffs. In 1866, for example, railroad iron sold for $80 a ton in the United States, whereas it was only $32 a ton in Britain. Second, the federal government would lose much of its tax revenue since articles imported into the Confederacy would divert tariff revenue from the North to the South. Now, this is a secondary factor. The bigger factor was loss of the domestic monopolies that the tariffs provided to cotton textile manufacturers, iron products, and woolen products, and others that had those protective tariffs. Palin's analysis also falls into a second trap by arguing that rates were too low in 1861 to provoke a war, even if they were increased. 
Such arguments typically compare customs duties in 1860 to earlier years, but ignore the steep and protracted rise during and after the war. Nonetheless, the victor's conduct after Appomattox better reveals his true motives for militarily subjugating the South than does his dubious rep, uh, rhetoric before the fighting began. Now, what I want to do here is to share my screen and show you something. Here we go. Share. Okay. On the eve of the Civil War, rates on dutiable items averaged 19%. But thereafter, they averaged about 45% until Democrat Woodrow Wilson became president 50 years later in 1913. Although Wilson reduced rates, Republicans increased them after regaining control of the federal government in the 1920s. The GOP did not welcome free trade until after 1945. And you can see that in the sharp decline uh, right here in the, mid, the midpoint between 18, 1940 and 1950. The sharp decline there shows that the Northerners, the United States, America, welcomed free trade after 1945 when the region north of the Ohio River and the Mason-Dixon line had virtually no competition for manufactured goods anywhere in the world since the economies of Europe and Asia had been wrecked by World War II. Only at that time did the, those, those states north of the Ohio River and the Mason-Dixon line say, hey, we want everybody to reduce tariffs now because, hey, we want to supply the whole world with what we have since we have no competition in the world. A third Palin era, may, uh, the third era that Palin makes is to ignore the adverse impact of import tariffs on domestic industries that export most of their output. Now, I'll, I'll just uh, stop sharing here so that I can get back into the mode here of just talking to you. There is no better example than American cotton, which normally exported 75% of its crop annually when the Civil War started. The dominant buyers were Britain and France, which typically obtained the exchange credits needed to buy American cotton by selling finished manufacturing goods into the United States. But high protective tariffs made it difficult for the European manufacturers to sell those goods competitively in the United States, as noted in the railroad example I provided earlier. The resulting shortage of exchange credits to those uh, Europeans had two repercussions. One was to motivate European cotton buyers to seek new feedstock sources away from the American South. Thus, domestic import tariffs invited countries to compete with American cotton. Notable examples included Egypt, India, West Africa, and Brazil after the Civil War. The, the other result was to force the Euro Europe to buy less American cotton than they otherwise would by shrinking the market uh, and thereby shrinking the market for Southern farmers. Such consequences lasted at least 70 years when commenting upon a multi-year decline in cotton exports as late as 1935. For example, Assistant Treasury Secretary Oscar Johnston wrote, quote, the major cause of the decline is the inability of foreign consumers to obtain American exchange currency. Southern farmers needed export markets, but what they got were high American tariffs on manufactured goods that drove export customers to seek other sources of cotton, aside from the American South. The myth that needs debunking is that the North went to war to end slavery, whereas it truly went to war to avoid the economic consequences of disunion. To learn more about that, you can get it from Causes of the Civil War by Philip Lee, $22 at Amazon, Barnes and Noble and other bookstores. If you'd like an autographed copy from me it, here in the United States, I'll deliver it for $25. Just email me, Phil, P-H-I-L, underscore Lee, L-E-I-G-H at me.com. Okay, that's our show for today and I'll be back soon with more.